hadn't done a zoom i've done stream yard but not zoom yeah and i didn't and i was we like, had to get oh. the app <laughs> i did i was like oh i don't have the app installed <laughs> well you know what the good news about zoom is if you're using your phone yes you need the app but if you don't use your phone you don't need to actually have the app on your computer to do maybe download it so yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i don't yeah. know so we're live we're live talking about hey! zoom all right Woo here we are so, yes once again lee aaron a pleasure that you made the show once again and of course sean kelly who actually i've interviewed before with coney hatch so that's yes, right yeah that's right that's right we spoke it's strange enough but el mocambo when coney hatch was playing there and doing their live performance that's when we spoke with Sean and the rest of the guys. So there you go. There's a connection. Cool. There's a connection. Cool. All right. So what's Very going cool. on, everybody? How you doing? Good. 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 Well, um, I think probably the thing I'm most excited about doing on my birthday is having a rehearsal. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a rare I treat. Rare I know treat. it's like so goofy, but I had all these friends in Toronto. They planned a dinner and they wanted to take me out, and I'm like, you know what? We're recording live. I think I'd rather rehearse. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how long has it? Just, so how long has it been since everybody's gotten together? Is this? Is this? Is this? You haven't really gotten together, like, I, I'm sure you have. You've been playing some shows, right? Rehearsing. Um, is that what you mean? Well, we we were together in Sweden uh, just recently. We were over there doing a show, but um, the because we're a bi-coastal band. We just don't get a lot of opportunities to actually get together and really effectively work out parts. I mean, once in a while we'll do like a, okay. you know, like a FaceTime call or whatever, or even a phone call where we, Sean will play me something on the phone and I'll bounce something back. But um, to actually get an actual, you know, real bona fide in-person rehearsal is doesn't happen too often. So I'm just, I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> so so you, you don't hard. get to jam. That's what you're saying. You don't get to jam. Yeah, what do you think, Sean? <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I, I love it. I think the only other, I think we've rehearsed three times as a band. The first time before the first run of dates I did when, when I joined. Mm -hmm. And right. then I think we did it once in Vancouver, but but we actually ended up shooting a video that day. That's right. <laughs> and, then, and I think this is the third time. So I love it because it's just another chance to hang out. <laughs> well, the last time we we uh we got together in a room and just rehearsed for a couple of days we wrote radio on basically <laughs> that's right, right? <laughs> like we wrote an album well i'm like oh that's a really cool idea i'm gonna record that you know on, on my phone <laughs> and then at the end of it, i'm like we got an album guys well we're gonna go do an album so it was just yeah so you know it's just exciting because it's a great bunch of people i love i love everybody in my band uh, a great creative bunch of people that have so much to bring to the table and so much to offer yeah. into this musical unit. Um, so yeah, what would I rather be doing on my birthday? Nothing but rehearsing, really, hanging out with my favorite people. That's that's it. That's what we, that's go. what jamming and rehearsing is all about, right? Yeah. Just hanging out and playing music and the stuff that you love to do, right? That that's kind of what it comes down to, right? The core of it all. All right. So you're playing on uh, Friday, I guess it's the twenty second. You're playing Correct. a live show. Yep. It's 30, I don't know, what is it, 38 years? Are we allowed to say 38 years or should we just say 25 years plus 10? What are you going to say here? <laughs> you can say whatever you like. <laughs> so, all it's right. Been, uh, so, you showcased the Metal Queen yep. so long ago, a few, three decades ago, and now you're kind of going back to where it all started from, right? So, maybe both well, of you want yeah, to tell me a little bit so. about that. You know, you yeah. Gotta, yeah, like I, I it's funny for me to go back and like see the pictures and the images and the some of the footage from that because i'm like i was just like i was 21 years old i was like a, a kid a puppy right um so yeah it's kind of nice I, I think the coolest thing about it is that you know um our set is going to embrace a lot of the nostalgic material that people love our fans we're going to give the fans what they want but a large percentage of our set is material from the albums that we've written and recorded in the last six years since 2016 and um there's just sort of a fresh injection of creative energy in this band and we're doing lots of making lots of new music right now yeah. and um so you're gonna see it's kind of like nostalgia mixed with you know nouveau as well so you're gonna it's gonna be a really neat show i'm excited yeah and and i should say sean you know, I should have prefaced this with Sean Kelly, the Rudy Sarzo of Canada, right? <laughs> the guy who plays in all the great bands in Canada. 
Coney Hatch, mm -hmm. Helix, and of course Lee Aaron. And that was a compliment, Lee, to to, to Sean. <laughs> he's just played in all the greats and I'll he's played with all the great people. You know, um, Sean, tell me a little bit about the history of El Mocambo Club for those people who don't know this iconic club that's been around for so long. Well, I mean, uh, I can't really speak too much to the history other than, you know, I know what everybody else knows. I know the Rolling Stones recorded an, yeah, an iconic yeah, record yeah. there. And it was certainly a place when I moved to Toronto that I, I it, it was uh, a real hallmark to have the opportunity to play mm -hmm. there. And I knew about its history. Um, but uh, to see this rejuvenated El Macombo is really something. They put so much, uh, so many resources and and they've turned it into a place that's both intimate and yet feels like a world-class arena spectacle. It's, it's, it's really something to behold. And uh, it's an honor to play there. It was an honor to play there back when I moved here to Toronto in 91. And it's uh, especially an honor to be playing there. I mean, you know, I'm getting to play the Alma Combo with Lee Aaron. How, yeah. how, oh, yeah. how good does it get? It's, I've been there. It's a great place. Uh, Lee, yeah. is this going to be a showcase of like all of Metal Queen plus your other material is that what you're planning on doing in terms of a set list you mean going back and playing the entire metal queen album yeah yeah you know a lot of bands that are doing that right a lot of bands are doing that today so yeah that would be a no we're not okay. doing all of the material from that album yeah. you will hear metal queen definitely <laughs> and you will hear um you know it, you know what happens is it gets kind of hard when you've got so many albums yes. under your belt mm -hmm. that you know it's hard enough just as a band figuring out what we're going to play. <laughs> Never mind every fan that's emailing you going, are you going to do this song? This song's my favorite <laughs> song. And what about this song from this album? We're like, I'm like, ah, you know, so um, we did revamp our set list somewhat for this show um, to include some sort of classic picks from some of the older albums. Right, yep. Sean? And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So uh it isn't going to be the same set fans have heard for the last couple of years it's going to be slightly different and uh so I'm super excited about that and um yeah and then we've cherry picked a few from radio one and a couple of the newer albums as well so it's going to be a nice blend um you know we were thinking live recording as well at the same time when we were putting together this set list and we're like you know what can we effectively i mean obviously stuff that's super lush and super dense and has tons of layers of guitars isn't going to translate as well live as something that is down and dirty <laughs> and we can pull it off as a three-piece right um and so we were thinking about that when we were going to do the live recording as well what can we effectively pull off and make just make it sound great as a power i mean we're a power quartet kind of right yeah and, and sean just tell us a little bit about the yeah. recording facility at elma combo like you've done coney hatch there last year or a year and a half ago i believe I mean, yes, it, that's it, right. It's sort of like it, it's now it's designed sort of to capture that live that live recording, right? That's right. I, I believe they brought Eddie Kramer in to help sound design wow. the room. You know, the famous producer, and it, it, it's really sensational. They've got a world class broadcast facility within the walls of that venue now, and um, yeah, I was very proud of the results that uh, came about from the Coney Hatch record, <laughs> and uh, and you know I this band uh when we go out you know what you see is what you get no tracks all live we deliver you know it, it's it's as honest as it gets and what a great uh place to capture that authentically yeah no no i've i've, I've seen you guys play live at heavy montreal i think that was the last time and wow you guys sound great you know it's you guys always sound great live and lee your voice it just doesn't age it just you know it's always <laughs> good right it's always great Aww. you know Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And knock on wood. I'm just, yeah. Is it <laughs> the is it the new this. brand of your coffee? I'm just trying to plug your coffee here. Is that the new <laughs> brand of your coffee that's helping with the vocal cords? Is that it? I, I think that's that's the secret, right? That's the secret. <laughs> we'll go with that. Clear in coffee. <laughs> Tell us about the coffee venture. Well, Sean and I sort of both uh, stumbled <laughs> at the same time. Because Coney Hatch here. is there too. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I got approached by writers and rockers, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, a few months ago, and they were like, hey, you know, we're partnering with some Canadian uh, artists that we we love, and we want to know if you'd like to partner with us on a coffee brand. And I thought, you know, it's funny because I discussed with my manager guy over the last year, 
um, the idea of doing some type of branding partnership, but nothing seemed quite right for me. I mean, you know, a SAS has her wine, alcohol didn't seem right for me. And, and then when the, the idea of the coffee came up, I went like, okay, who, who, who is my age that's, you know, had family and lived through, you know, you know, uh, raising children that doesn't love coffee, you know, come on, <laughs> you know, it's become a, a life source. Survival, you know? basically. It survival. just seemed like the perfect thing. So yeah, it was cool. They sent me a few, um, a few blends and I d told them what I liked and what I didn't like. And then that's how they designed the Lear and Body Rock blend. And then, and then we just worked on a name. They were talking about doing Metal Queen coffee but it you know it's it's uh it's just been co-opted a few too many times i just thought body rock spoke to my sure, heart yeah. <laughs> right, you know get your body going in the morning so and um the other thing we've d d i've done with them is um we they support um a, a cancer foundation called never alone mm -hmm. cancer foundation and so all the artist proceeds from the lier and body rock coffee uh, goes to that foundation when you buy a bag of that coffee. So, um, yeah, it's just a cause that was near and dear to my heart. And very I want cool. to very cool indeed. I'll put the link. Things. Yeah, I'll put the yeah. link in the video right after. Um, and if people want to check, does that do you ship to the United States? Because I know there's food restrictions globally, right? With alcohol and coffee. Do you know if it ships only to Canada or or the globally? Or because there's a lot of people who watch from all around the world. You know, they might want to have a cup of coffee. So that's a good question. Do you know, Sean? I, I, I don't know. I, w I wish I did. I was hoping you'd know. I do know the answer. Uh, you know I, know, I, do good... know. I do know the answer. Oh, do you? Typically, well, tip, but I, maybe there is another. What, like, what is this, like, stump the rock star today? <laughs> yeah, geez. <laughs> what is, no fair. What is, we only count to four what, men. What are duties? <laughs> um, if it's made in Canada, then you could only basically ship it within Canada. But if it's sort of made in the U.S., and distribute it there then you could distribute it alcohol you can't cross border coffee you can't okay. cross border so i i don't know if they're making this in canada or they're making this in the u.s that's why i asked the question uh, you know i know that it is packaged up here yeah but in terms of where they're sourcing their beans yeah, and yeah no it's that, the packaging it's a packaging yeah yeah so probably just canada unfortunately yeah you know yeah. um but again, they could be packaging in the U.S. as well, right? And then they I'm going to ask that question. I'm going to I'm going to email Robert right after I get off the line with you and ask him. Okay, these are good questions. These are yeah. really so okay, Sean. Very what edifying. About, yes. <laughs> Stump the rock star. I like that, Sean. <laughs> no fair. <laughs> Sean, uh, tell me yes, about like. Jimmy. Are you are you like bouncing off ideas for Lee for a new album? Now it's been gas and. Uh, Oh my God. Iron gasoline. gasoline? Yes, yes. From It's been like, what, a year and a half now? How, how long has it been this last live uh, studio album? Sorry. Oh, well, well, Fire and Gasoline was actually 2016. And we Jeez. and then it was Diamond Baby Blues. Diamond Baby Blues. And, 2018. And then the, 2018. Then and we I'm had the, the Christmas album, then Radio On. I radio mean, On, that's what Yeah, radio, radio, radio On is was the most 2020 or, 2020 or 2021? 2021 it came out in july 2021 that's right okay. that's um, right it was our covid baby <laughs> what about COVID new material exactly. are, are, are well, you actually no that elevates the covid covid baby really yeah right yeah, so true. sean's welcome to pipe in but um go ahead yes radio one came out in july 2021 um and we currently uh, have just finished another studio album <laughs> so there you go. All right. So there you go. Because so we've had a lot of time, right? With COVID, right? There was a lot of time and a lot of bands have written a lot of music. Sean, yeah, are you, yeah. Are, are you Yeah, like, you know, are you, uh, when you're, uh, the initial question you're asking me about bouncing ideas, I'm constantly pestering Lee with ideas because it's, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think it's the buzz that we're chasing at this point in our lives. The creation, just the, the, the process of creation mm -hmm. that comes out of friendship. And, and sharing our influences and getting in the room. It's really exciting. And this uh, Radio On was like that. Like Lee said, we got together and she had this idea. She goes, guys, let's, let's just write something like we're 16 years old. We're in the basement and, uh, and, and we're just going to, you know, have fun, write stuff that excites us, not worry about getting on the radio. Um, 
which is ironic for an album called Radio. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Don't you but, think? Okay. But right. but you know what? Uh, it, it's it's that joy of sharing ideas, and I think we're all just searching for that that thing. And and, and that happened again with uh, with uh, the new album Elevate and getting together in the room, working with Mike Fraser and, and, and with Lee producing, and we're all kind of just vibing off each other and, and, and creating that together. It, it's a special chemistry, and it's one that. I appreciate more and more, especially after COVID, where we where we had to be separated. Um, it, it's really special to me, and I, I'm I'm so grateful for it. And uh, yeah, and you know what? You're gonna you're gonna see it if you come down to the Elma Combo too. You'll you'll see it live on stage. It, it's, in, it's in our concert interactions, our recording interactions, and even when we're sending, when I'm phoning her up, we're sending her a, a, a voice message with a guitar riff <laughs> from my basement. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you, Which you is just often, get like as you just play it it's just a like guitar riff out of nowhere <laughs> yeah and dave too dave Reimer and you know and, and john we're all in there we're all in the mix right throwing all this stuff around it, it, it's it's wonderful people well, are commenting as we speak so rod jo rob johnson says radio on is a brilliant album so he's he's giving you guys a lot of props there thank okay. you yeah and thanks in, rob in yeah. terms of okay so you're you're where is this organically going to go in terms of a style for the next album like what is it part two of radio one and excuse me for messing up all the albums before but radio one is this like a continuation of that where are you going now are you waiting for I'm me asking, yes <laughs> i'm waiting for you yes um i would say it springboards from from where radio one left off you know unfortunately because of the COVID restrictions because Radio One was written literally just before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And then we recorded the bed tracks during COVID, finished the album during COVID, but we were still able to get into a room to write the songs together. Elevate, the new album was created um, during COVID. So it unfortunately was the process of sending files back and forth. So, so the vibe is a little more different, maybe even a little more structured, would you say, Sean? But 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 well thought out, well thought out in structured songs, if that makes any sense. And um, yeah, and I mean, it just I think it just takes radio on to uh, to a whole other level. I think we delved into even a little bit more uh, pseudo political territory with some of the lyrics, okay. and some of our feelings. I mean, we're all growing up in this bizarre age right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so many weird things going on in the world right now and i think that was reflected it, uh, on the material from the new album that hasn't been released yet it will we're hoping pre-christmas but if it doesn't work out because of you know the the timeline for vinyl right now it'll probably be the spring of next year um yeah so so um, the album's called elevate that that's what i want to clarify it's that, this elevate. is a big reveal because we haven't told anybody <laughs> it's elevate here yeah. we go so everybody yeah. out there and there's this guy chris p who's writing like 100 messages he loves you <laughs> okay and he will be excited by knowing this is elevate. oh i know chris p. <laughs> mr chris p <laughs> mr chris p on mr crispy on oh, mr crispy oh, mr. Okay. so wait a second so okay what else <laughs> yes. okay so it's called elevate it's been it's done it's in the can it's it's finished yeah, the, art, the artwork is done. No, okay, all right, all <laughs> I right. just uh, did a did a photo session a couple of days ago, so I'm just picking pictures for okay for gotcha. the cover, and then we're um, yeah, going to be shooting some more stuff hopefully as a band, and yeah. Okay, so the album's done. The pictures yeah. are in the in progress, right? Yeah. Is the marketing team, you know, are they ready to go? Is this because this is going to be Christmas? This is coming up. They will be ready to go. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Is there anything else that uh, I'm trying to think? What else on a new album? How many songs? Ten. Ten. Well, okay. So here's the thing: we recorded 14 <laughs> tunes, and okay. we we even wrote we wrote a couple radio like that was the cool when Sean was talking about this whole exciting creative process. We just get together and magical things started happening. We wrote two songs pretty much in the studio, didn't we? Yeah, the title you know, track, right? That. Elevate, what came out at that time. I know, it's just like, Dave had this idea, and we're like, okay, let's sit down, let's hash this out. 15 minutes later, we're like, okay, Mike, roll, roll tape. Roll tape. <laughs> roll tape, we're going to record right now. And we, yeah. Um, but uh, some of the songs are long. A couple of them are long. Um, I was speaking with well, my well, husband. Well, define, well, define long. Are we talking about like a 20-minute rush song here? What are we talking about long? Um, 
I think there's like, no, 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 no. We're not talking 2112. We're talking but like, you know, <laughs> five plus minutes. Okay. Right? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. My hubby, who is a vinyl yes, uh, yes. aficionado yes. of all sorts, uh, says, you want it to be 45 minutes long. You can't have more than 45 minutes. It'll wreck your vinyl, <laughs> the yeah. sound of your vinyl. I'm like, okay. So I had to come up with, the, had the very difficult task of coming up with a running order that was 45 minutes long okay. for the album. And uh, so we ended up shaving it down to about 10 tracks. Mm -hmm. I mean, the great and beautiful thing is now we have tra ever extra tracks in the bag and I'm not sure what we're going to do with them, but uh, they will come out on something in the future. Yep. Um, you know, we have a few... Uh, I, I, uh, future projects percolating as we speak um and they will probably end up on that so um but it's a yeah it's a 10 song album you know my some of my favorite albums of all time are like the the nine and the 10 song albums from the late oh. 70s and the early 80s that are just like short masterpieces right and um so my theory is this my theory is this if you have yeah. an album with 10 songs right you can have a masterpiece, but once you throw in three fillers, then the masterpiece diminishes, right? So, well, that's the thing. There's no fat. There's no fat right. on this record. Trim it all down. Trim it all down. Yeah. 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 Sean, let me let me ask yeah. you this. So, you guys both went to a Sweden recently. Canadians in yes. Sweden. Uh, yes. And I'm sure it's not your first time, but what was that experience like for Canadians watching? You know, what's Sweden? What's different about? What's the shock, culture shock about Sweden versus Canada? Well, you know what? I don't think there's too much culture shock. I, I will say I marvel at their uh, their structural efficiency. Uh, I guess that's why we got IKEA. Uh, like everything okay. runs very well. Everything. Um, we were in. A, we stayed in a beautiful little village. The name actually escapes me, which is embarrassing. But um, uh, it was it was absolutely incredible to see how much they care communally about the space that they inhabit. Okay. That's what I love about Sweden. And, uh, you know, uh, Dave and I went out for a walk and we ended up just kind of wandering into this old church, you know, open the door, you know, it's like the Hardy boys. Hey, what's in here? <laughs> and we opened up, we opened up, <laughs> opened up the door and uh, this gorgeous church revealed itself with beautiful acoustics. And sure enough, the caretaker comes out and gives us a full tour, lets me play the piano. And like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it was, it was just wonderful and how proud they were of their heritage. So, um, that strikes me. Um, and also, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Swedish rock too. Right. So, I mean, there's yeah. a real, it's similar to Germany too. And in a lot of Europe, they, they appreciate, um, classic rock, hard rock in all of its iterations. And that's why you can have these festivals where you have bands like Megadeth and Lee Aaron on the same bill. Yes, uh, yes. It, it makes sense because they appreciate everything. Right. So, yeah, yeah. um, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I'm going to ask Lee the same question right now. Lee, what did you enjoy about Sweden or not, you know, or what was the culture shock of it all or not? Yeah. Well, I've been there before yeah. and I've I, not only have I played there before, but I've done uh, promotional tours there. But yeah, I mean, um, exactly what Sean is saying is there's um, a real sense of community. They're very, you know, they're, they're like the Germans and that they're very technologically advanced. Everything mm -hmm. is like, um, you know, state of the art when you arrive there. So state of the art that our board froze. <laughs> so, Too we, clever by we half. Had a little, yeah, we right. had a little issue with our uh, our state of the art digital console up front <laughs> during the show. But um, but uh, you know, they were they were running around like a very efficient team. They got it so <laughs> right away. You know, um, uh, you know. We uh, we chose to not backline any guitars or not not backline. We chose to not fly with any guitars this time because we had a very tight connection wow. in Paris. Yeah. And my my travel guru ness tells me that those those guitars would not make that connection. And you know we arrived. They had the guitars we needed. Sean wanted an extra guitar. He just had to you know make a have a conversation or two and a little sweet talk. You know, <laughs> no yeah, pun intended. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> a little so sweet dog. <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, there we go. And um, and they just, you know, the moment from the moment we arrived, you know, that we had a personal assistant just assigned to us that was, you know, this totally amazing, funky lady from, you remember Love her? her. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And, you know, Emily. Emily. Like, Emily. Yeah. I thought it was Amelia. Oh, it could you're be. Right. It could you're be. Right. It depends where you're from. Okay, I think, I think Amelia, you're right. She was just, she was just, so amazing you know anything we required or needed or it was just there and um so um 
Yeah, I mean, they just, it just seemed like every aspect of that. I mean, sometimes you do a festival and you're going, everything is great, but the food is terrible, you know, really? or everything is great. The food is fantastic, but boy, they sure cheaped out on monitors or, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, okay, okay, okay. you just don't feel like every single chocolate aspect everywhere every, in Sweden, just chocolate everywhere. Bank yeah, like every single everywhere. aspect of everything was, was first class. That's so nice. it's just a real treasure to play there. And I really cool. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Perrin's asking, ask Lee if she'd do the Montreal Jazz Fest again. How many artists can say they've done heavy Montreal and Montreal International <laughs> Jazz Fest? It's pretty cool. Well, I would say, you know, it, go ahead. And that's, it's funny because that's what my husband says as well. He said, how many artists can play both the Jazz and Blues Festival and the Heavy Rock Festival? Um, I would love to do Montreal Jazz again, but I think all of these festivals sort of have like a certain... Um, so many year turnaround without mm -hmm. having the same artists on the bill. Yeah. So I know that I got pitched for Montreal Jazz this year, but oh. I think they came back with the answer that, you know, she just closed that festival three years ago. So um, I think we need to wait another year or two. But um, yeah, absolutely. It's in my intentions to come back. So um, I hope we see you soon on Montreal yeah. Jazz. Yeah. You know, Voivod played the Montreal Jazz Festival, just so you know, Voivod played the Montreal I think Festival. That's they, a, I think yeah. that's authentic. They're, they're pretty jazzy. They, There's they, a they, lot of jazz. They, 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 they take section. it to the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sean, how did you yeah. hook up originally with uh, Lee Aaron? I, it, it, do, do you prefer people call you Karen or Lee? Um, well, professionally, Lee. Yes, yes. my good okay. friends call me Karen. Okay, yeah. all right, all right. All right. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. people don't... <laughs> you never know, right? I don't know. Sean, how did you originally hook up with... Uh, Lee or Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Aaron, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know what? I, I had, uh, I, I had, I was working on a book about Canadian hard rock and heavy metal called Metal on Ice. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to interview iconic artists, Canadian artists, and obviously Lee Aaron's name's at the top of that list. So I, I just reached out for an interview and um, she was gracious enough to grant me one. Yeah. We had, uh, uh, I think I think we had a pretty good instant rapport, and and her answers were so you know informed and so insightful, and uh, you know um, at the time I was writing the book, I was working for a company, a music company called Coalition Music. Mm -hmm. The founders there said, "Hey, it would be cool to make a record." You know, we had a deal with Warner at the time. Hey, well, why don't we do an album to go along with your book, and you can maybe talk about re-recording some classic Canadian songs. And I reached out to Lee, and uh, fortunately enough, she was open to it, which uh, prompted me. I flew to Vancouver, and we uh, went into a studio to work on a vocal. And we just, I think we just hit it off on a different level. Like, I mean, first of all, I was intimidated. You know, like, I mean, <laughs> who am I to be in the studio with Lee Aaron and, and, and actually trying to comment on some stuff, you know? But she was so amazing and so effortless. She's such an effortlessly incredible singer. I was just kind of blown. And no, that's the truth. That's the truth. I won't say that to you in person, but I'll say it. I'll say it on here. Say it to um, everybody else. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because it is the truth. And uh, it, it was such a great experience. And then we just started talking. And I don't know, Lee. Do you? Do you? Do you maybe you could even. Well, you this said, better. "Hey, if you ever need a a sub." You know, if you're coming to Toronto and you want someone to sub for your guitar player, and <laughs> Lee saying, out, "I don't remember it happened that way." Go ahead. Do you remember that? And then I, yeah, I, I do. I do Toronto remember that to play a show, and uh, my the guitar player from Vancouver, um, he had become increasingly more unavailable because he started another side project that was taking a lot of his time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have no, nothing negative. Like Rob Hamilton was a great guitar player. I have nothing negative to say about him at all. But um, he would just got super busy, and so the, I was asking him to do shows, and he was like, "Ah, you know, I can't do that weekend." And I'm like. I'm gonna to have to find a sub, another sub. And so mm -hmm. coming to Toronto, I said to Sean, you know, if you want it, you, you want a sub on this show, I'd love it. So, and that was our first rehearsal. Cool. <laughs> so, That's right, rehearsal remember? number one. <laughs> rehearsal I, I number one, came to Toronto. And I, honestly, like I think about, you know, half of a verse into the first song, Sean has um, a playing style that I, particularly gra like this sort of just sort of swaggery behind the beat kind of vibe to his playing that I love and I've been looking for someone to 
emulate that ever since John Albany left the band in like the 90s. And it was about halfway through the first song. I'm looking at my husband and he's looking at me. I'm like, I, this guy's got to join our band. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then it, pretty much by the end of the that show and that rehearsal weekend, I'm like, so you're joining the band, right? And he's like, he's like, right on. And done deal. That's kind of how it's like <laughs> he joined the band. And then I we were at a, a, like a couple shows later, he's like, Hey, I got a couple of ideas. I was wondering if you want to <laughs> play it. And I said, I really like that one. I said, send me that. And just like, and so it just sort of snowballed from there, from there. You know, when we first started writing together, it was a little bit, a little bit nervous because it is, you know, when you're exposing your most intimate ideas to someone for the first time, it is a bit like, you know, trying on swimsuits in front of a stranger, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like, I know the feeling. But, uh, you know, um, <laughs> But I think the beautiful thing about the, this band now, you know, eight, nine years in is that we're all so comfortable with each other. Nobody's feelings are hurt if I go, yeah, you know, not really digging that one, you know. And that's um, important. That's an important point. You got to totally be comfortable is. enough to tell people not to bruise their ego, but you're looking for the best. Go ahead. Sorry. And sometimes, you know, there are some magical things happen where like someone hears something somebody else doesn't in this band. Like Sean had sent me this idea I don't know, a few months ago. And he goes, I don't know if you'll like it. It's kind of weird. And I'm like, I the, when I've heard it the first time, it totally like spoke to my heart. I was just like, what do you mean it's weird? It sounds like the Rolling Stones. I love this idea. And like within a couple of days, I'd written some vocals in, for it. And and it, it just instantly connected yeah. for both of us. And um, yeah, so yeah, it's just it's really great when magic like that. Well, yeah, you know what? I think Sean, I've seen him on other occasions, other with your band, and he just seems like he's that that reliable, great artist musician that just gels with everyone. Sean, just congratulations on that. Thanks. I, I'm the Derek Smalls of the group. I'm the lukewarm water. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you know what? It's 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 a joy to do because. I'm coming, at, especially with Lee Aaron, I'm, I'm coming not only as someone who appreciates her as an artist, I'm a fan, right? I grew up, not, uh, not much different age difference, but I did grow up listening to Lee Aaron, right? And, and, you know, like Body Rock was like a formative record for me in the work that John Albini did and the work that, that Lee did. So, I mean, I feel very, very fortunate. So, yeah, I'm, it's an honor to be able to contribute Art, on an artistic level yeah. with somebody of that caliber right so okay i, promised, I just try to make it as easy as possible I, I promised art art he said jimmy can you please tell the aaron you know he he's, he loves your music body rock is one of his favorite albums oh, thank and you. i just i do a shout out for him just for you okay um let's go into this is the metal voice i'm gonna ask some metal questions here from your past and sean i'm gonna start with you you were yeah. part of the randy rhodes documentary yes so you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was, I, I will. Uh, the, I actually started, I scored, originally the movie was called Randy Rhodes, The Quiet Riot Years. Yeah, and it right. came out um, as with a coffee table book that Ron mm -hmm. Sobel had done. And I, I got that gig because I was working as an MD on a show called Cover Me Canada on CBC. Mm -hmm. And one of the producers was uh, working on this documentary. Peter Margolis and he we got talking he was a student of Randy Rhodes they were working on this and they needed somebody to come up with uh, some score quickly so at the time I said hey I'm I'm your guy you know I, I, I and fortunately got the got that gig and did that and then that movie got curtailed uh for a number of years but very recently uh it resurfaced in a big way and uh, fortunately, my score remained intact. So uh, we negotiated, cool. and yeah, that's why. It, actually, D. Snyder just wrote me and said, "Hey, dude, I just saw your, your the documentary you scored." So that that was a thrill. You know, that's amazing. I've been like I've interviewed uh, the Rhodes family, Kelly and Kathy, and I've been to Musoni. I don't know if you ever been there or not, but uh, haven't. But huge well follower of Randy Rhodes. That's why I'm asking you now. Lead. Somebody asked me yeah. to ask you. Bruce Dickinson jumps on stage with you at Lemoore's back in, I don't know, I'm guessing 84, 85. You want to tell us a little bit about your sort of your duet singing with Bruce Dickinson on stage at Lemoore's in New York? <laughs> well, um, yeah. Um, again, that was just, I think it was just pre-Metal Queen um, mm -hmm. release. It, was it 84? 
Yeah, um, I, I know he, I was about 21 and he was about 24, 25. And um, we had created somewhat of a buzz on the Eastern seaboard um, with our album only being available as an import at the time. And we'd gone down there to do a few shows and uh, Iron Maiden was in New York recording, I believe the Power Slave yeah, I think so. yeah. album. And uh, there was a bit of a buzz about us and they came out after they finished recording. And I, I know we, you know, uh, someone came up and said, you know, the guys in Iron Maiden are here. And I'm like, holy crap, really? <laughs> <laughs> like what? And they're, and and Bruce would like to get up and Steve, I think Steve Harris got up and played and Bruce wanted to get up and sing. And we're like, whoa, what can we do? So we don't laugh. We, we played uh, Tush by ZZ Top. <laughs> and um it's a blues song right and so uh so we duetted on that i wish there was a recording floating around of so it there is no recording no nothing oh uh, right. well it was uh, totally spontaneous and nobody had these back then right, yeah, yeah. right. you know so it, it wasn't like you, you know someone spontaneously had a video recorder in the, the audience but um yeah and uh yeah and then we ended up hanging out like for a few hours after the show just befriending those guys and like just great guys like super like not um like they were just in a league by themselves if i can say that professionals they were pro they were classy they were intelligent they weren't you know this sort of down and dirty you know uh, your typical rock and roll boys at that time and so (laughs) we just if that makes any sense you know um then yeah we, we 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 got along with them and yeah just just great guys did you ever reconnect with them over the years um yeah on a, uh, it escapes me now where but it's been years now since i've ever talked to bruce but um yeah a couple times over the years we reconnected at various uh you know festival events and things like that but um yeah great band now i don't know if this is accurate or not these are the the set list you played you played whole lot of love by led zeppelin that night was that right yeah, well, back in my early days, just early like days, Robert, yeah. I did quite a few Zeppelin covers. Look at this, ACDC, Sin City, Judas Priest, You Got Another Thing Coming. Were those the songs? That would have been great to hear. Yeah. I think it would have been very cool. You got the voice for that. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, so what else can, can you guys tell me about, uh, you know, the upcoming show? Uh, after the show, what's the tour date looking like, Sean? Like, where are you guys going? Well, we have Kitchener the next night. We're playing mm-hmm. uh, a festival in Kitchener with uh, Trooper and Helix. And then I believe the next one after that, we're in Calgary for a casino date on the 30th. And then there's dates in Saskatchewan and Vancouver and ultimately off to Germany. But, wow. but you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll let Lee feel that. I'm, yeah, I, I don't know if my calendar summer. could play the info, but we're doing a fair amount of Canadian dates this summer. Mm-hmm. Um, we're doing Calgary, uh, these are festivals, Calgary, Edmonton, yep. Edmonton, right? Uh, Rock the River, Saskatoon. We are heading over to Germany. We're headlining a festival in Hamburg uh, at the beginning of September. We're doing a festival here in Vancouver in the middle of August as well. And uh, so, yeah, you know, so. Um, Do you find like the demand has increased like globally, like since, you know, they're just file sharing now and. There's YouTube, but Lee Aaron, you know, has just become more popular than ever globally. Do you find that's the case? Uh, well, I I think that since I started, uh, I came back after motherhood yeah, in 2016 yeah, yeah. and started recording again. I think that that, and, you know, trying to, at that point in time, like I was a bit of a social media ninja. I was like, I got to figure out how to use all this stuff, yeah, you know, because yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> this is the new reality of, you know, being up on Spotify and on these social media platforms to, to um, be able to promote yourself and sort of getting a handle on that. I think um, just uh, figuring out how to, how to use this sort of modern marketing, these modern marketing tools mm-hmm. and just writing and continuing to record new music, I think has has brought about a bit of a renewed interest in Lee Aaron and the band. Yeah. Well, Which you Festival can I offer some world, pers- I can I offer some perspective on this? Um, before I was playing with with Lee Aaron and, and during for for a time, I was playing with Nelly Furtado, and we were doing lots of dates in Europe, big festivals, big arena shows. I can tell you this: when we went over to Europe, and I think the first festival we played was Bang Your Head Festival. Uh, 
the response was rapturous. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, you could tell that she's considered to be a major, major artist, not obviously in Canada, but in Europe as well. And so from my perspective, sitting back and just getting to play guitar and, and, <laughs> sit and watch out, it, it's amazing to see the response. And, uh, and, and equally thrilling, selfishly, I have to admit, with the new material too, to see how well it's received. And I do think that that's a part of, um, you know, Lee's uh, acumen with social media and connecting with the fans in a genuine way. Well, you know, I, 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 I see that. Guys, I'll tell you both, like looking at it from the outside, it seems that there is this wave, you know, this uh, this renewed, I don't know if we we'll call it renewed interest, but uh, an awareness and a lot more people are gravitating towards the music and globally, and reflect- not, not just Canada here, you know, parts of the U.S. I'm talking it, about globally, you know. At least it's that's reflected in the char- Yeah, it's reflected in the charts. I mean, the last three records, I think, that were commercially released in Europe were, were top 40 records, which is amazing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what about books? I, I saw someone type in, you know, you have a, you're working on a book or you're not working on a book or you're thinking about working on a book and this is questions for Lee. Oh, for me, I am working on a book. Um, I've had had to take a little bit of a hiatus from the writing for two reasons. We were we just launched into writing and recording a new album, which kind of took me away from the book. But my husband and I um, lived in the same location for over 20 years. My husband, I don't know if you're aware, um, he was recently featured in Record Collector. He has a record collection to rival the, the biggest collector's record. Like he's probably one of the biggest collectors of vinyl and media in North America. Um, it's crazy. Like we literally had a small gymnasium at, at our built at our old place to house it all. And I'm not joking, right, Sean? Oh no, it's 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 something to behold. <laughs> it is a marvel. And we were inched out by development. You know, uh, we were he dug in his heels. He did not want to move because of that beautiful space we lived in. But we got inched out by development and we just recently had to move. And we, rather than paying movers about sixty or $70,000 to move it, we chose to rent our old space back and gradually move it ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I literally at this point in time have two garage stalls full and two shipping containers sitting on my property full of media owned by my husband. Wow. We are waiting for the development permit to go through. Um, that has been nothing short of a mammoth undertaking and so um but it's done so yeah once these summer dates are done i'm gonna get back to writing that book um my, my wife always tells me what are you doing with all these albums what are you doing just listen to them <laughs> on youtube what are you doing what are you, what are you hoarding why are you hoarding it's just you collect you collect it, you collect, it, it, you collect yeah. till you don't have no space to live in anymore but um tell me about your book sorry go ahead no it's um you know it is uh it's my story. It's mostly autobiographical, obviously. I, I read something that Patti Smith said a couple of days ago. I was re- she was recently featured in Mojo magazine, and I think she called it autobiographical fiction. Oh, <laughs> and I love <okay>. that. <laughs> Is it sort of like, it obviously, it's a little bit, because everyone's memories are a little bit different, right? Yeah, um, so it's, it's, a, it's a lot about my childhood and growing up and stumbling into rock and roll and how I got started and... Um, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, uh, you know, I don't think it's just going to be a complete chronological trajectory. I think I'm, you know, I'm trying to interject a lot of my feelings around certain circumstances that happened in my life. And mm-hmm. um, so, um, you know, I'll probably be able to give you a better overview when it's finished, but that's where we're at right now. Are you halfway um, mark writing it? Are you at the halfway mark? I'm at, I'm at about, I don't know, 30,000 words right now. Wow. So is that halfway? I don't know. Sean, Chapter right. seven, Sean Kelly. Okay, Sean, what about your book? Are you working uh, on a second book? I am, yeah. And uh, it's exciting. We're kind of getting that exciting time where we're looking at, you know, uh, book cover artwork and uh, setting off excerpts. And uh, and that book is uh, going to be called uh, Don't Call It Hair Metal, um, The Art in the Excess of 80s Rock. And it's That's a long it's, title. Well, yeah, that, you know, great title. title though. We're gonna like go around. <laughs> That's go okay. I'm assuming I'm assuming people can read if they're picking up a book. So, yes, um, yes, yes. anyway, um, yeah, I, uh, I, 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 what I'm looking at is the music that I grew up listening to and loving, mm-hmm. which is sometimes, uh, how should I say, critically maligned. So my initial intention was to kind of write some kind of 
uh, defense defensive thesis on on the value of this, but I kind of abandoned that early on in the book. And really, what it is, it's just about the people who make the music I love and the perspective of growing up with that music and how I changed as that music changed and um, and and finding out you know about the impetus for artistic intention. Why do why do people do the things they do and how does it feel when commerciality is thrown into the mix and yeah, but basically it's a love letter to the music I grew up listening to, which is uh, the hard rock of the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to tell you, yes. I just, I just finished adding some amazing quotes from one Lee Aaron oh, that uh, I've, I've added a lot go. of depth there to the book. Go. Very gracious once again to, uh, to add some insight in my That's book. So right. thank you. I'm writing a book too. Life is a YouTuber <laughs> behind the scenes. Ah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> no joke. Um, very good. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. I think we covered everything. Is there anything you? One more thing before yes, we go. go. Ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Show One us your more coffee. thing. I, I, I'm going to rob your right, album. right back. All right. So one, one time, Sean. Radio on. Yeah. yeah. The uh, was originally released on white vinyl, and if you have white vinyl, it's now a collector's item because they. I think they only pressed about five or seven hundred, mm-hmm. and they sold out immediately. But this hey. just re-released. If you go to Amazon.ca, Amazon.com. Wow, look at that. On beautiful. Isn't that crazy? Ooh. And it's so I bet you it's like sort of like really thick too. It's not like that that flimsy yes. vinyl back in the day. So <laughs> this is also a limited edition. So I just wanted to share that. This has just come out. Um, so yeah, if you you know, pretty much on all the Amazon platforms worldwide. If you go searching for it, you can find it. And I just wanted to share that it's re-released. So if you didn't get your vinyl the first time, how because long, they sold out. How, how long does it take to order vinyl? Let's say you put an order today. How long would it take to like fulfill that shipment? It used to be two, three months when during COVID, everybody started doing vinyl. There mm-hmm. were plastic shortages and stuff. And and now it it's like six plus months. Yeah, yeah. Right now for vinyl to out for vinyl so that's it's a bit of an issue <laughs> sean, yeah sean what's your preferred uh, medium to like listen to music right now it's vinyl i am back into vinyl and i am currently buying all the albums that i gave away that's what i'm doing i'm just you Is know that when, crazy when i know I, I i i thought for sure that that was a format that was gone i mean can you think of a more inconvenient thing to do you know than you know, find a piece of plastic and drop a needle on it. But I am back in. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And well, um, and you know what? I think I'm going for cassettes next. I, I, no, no, no. Don't go there. Don't go there. Don't oh, go there. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> I thought we got rid of those. It. I remember nah, having nah, cassettes and I put them in my car and it was really cold and they never used to work well in the cold. They used to always well, break and not work. And I, I remember like enjoying listening to different albums, like Shout at the Devil. I put it on in different systems because sometimes I'd want to hear what it sounded like a little faster or a little slower. <laughs> <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> these, are, these are insane things that a digitized youth aren't going to know about, but these are things that we did. And uh, yeah. And, yeah, and, and I you just know remember I did, the old. Never... Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, the old tape unravel. You get the pencil out. Yeah. Like, oh, the CD, together. I'm still like ripping through the CD cover. Okay, but go ahead. Yes. But I have to say, my I, I have a What's 16 yours? year old son, yeah. and he loves vinyl. My, really? you know, so now of course John is really, really hoping that he will want to bequeath mm-hmm. his collection to. Or it's like, no, don't tell me I have to <laughs> keep this forever. You know, <laughs> into the next generation. <laughs> What's What's your preferred? Uh, medium to listen to music is is it is it the phone is it uh, spotify is it vinyl is it cassettes is it cds um to be honest i don't i don't even yeah yeah i have to be honest i'm kind of lazy and my my to get a good set of headphones and just listen to spotify lately it's just so convenient Uh, am i a terrible person (laughs) you're a terrible person but we'll let it go but I, but I, but I, I live, I live with a mountain of vinyl. So I, I think, I think that's that, what it is. that, you know, so. you, you're rebelling, you're rebelling. <laughs> what do you, like, I listen to Spotify too, though. I mean, really to have the world's music at your fingertips is pretty compelling, right? It's pretty great. But you know, I just like the ritual of throwing on a record. But what, what do you guys think about, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but you know, you have Spotify and then you have your albums and, it's kind of like they're, they're sort of profiting off of your work and they're not really actually doing anything other than re 
distributing your 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 artistic you know intellectual property i mean doesn't that and i'll ask you both this and feel free to weigh in i mean does it hurt in a way or is it or you're okay with it because it just spreads the message across the world i don't know well i don't know if that's a question you, you but can't, there's a question in there you know, somewhere yes i i don't want to sound like somebody's grandma you know like getting upset about mm. about technology you know uh, it's if you don't you can't you can't fight technology you can't yeah. fight it you can't you know and the only thing i've i've just learned to really embrace it and try to use it to my advantage has it hurt my paychecks oh my don't even talk to me i'm sure I'm sure sean can speak to that as well you know i used to get royalty statements you know and checks in the thousands tens of thousands and they that's dwindled down honestly to hundreds and it's just is what it is. However, my fan base still loves my fan. Base, let's be honest, my fans are between 40 and 60. They love to still have tangible product in their hands that, you know, they love buying vinyl. They love buying CDs still. Um, and because of that, I still have a career because no matter who signs me, they know I'm going to sell a certain amount of physical product. Right. Mm. Now, to quantify my statement about Spotify and listening on Spotify, I agree with you. Nothing sounds quite as nice as it does when you drop a needle on vinyl. Nothing has that warmth. Sure. And, and and I have, I still have turntables and I've got vinyl upon vinyl upon yes. vinyl here at my home. My thing, though, is I go, I listen to my own stuff and I go, ooh, if it sounds good on even on Spotify with my Apple headset, I know I've done a good record. My my modus operandi is I like to play something on the crappiest system I can, my mixes. And then I go, if it sounds good on this, coming out of this crappy little iPhone speaker, I know it sounds good. Yeah. You know? Sean, did you want to say something? I think you wanted to do a... Well, my, like, are, are, is your question about like the... the... I don't know. Uh, I, I don't like Spotify. And I'm going to be people. honest with you. Like to me, I just find it. It's. It, it's. I know it's convenient, and and that's cool. I get that. I just yeah. find that it's. And and I think what what Lee said. It. If you don't embrace it, you're just going to end up suffering at the end of the day, anyways, right? You're just not going to well, get your music out there. You, you know what? You you can. I forget it's a biblical quote, but you can live in the world, but not of the world, right? So yeah. you can listen. We can accept that this is happening. You can, you can, uh, I don't, I don't think it's right. I, I wish that, that the, the royalty pay payments were, were more fair. I wish that artists weren't tied to uh, prohibitive contracts that they signed years ago. Um, I, I think that there needs to be a review of those contracts. And I, I think that there needs to be an increase in the royalty payments. Having said that, I think it's in, uh, incumbent upon all artists to find a way to move forward. This is a way that people can hear your music easily. Yeah. But take a look at Lee Aaron. I mean, it's really essentially um, a, a highly developed cottage industry where uh, by super serving the fans with high quality music and, and with, with a genuine, authentic contact via social media mm -hmm. and, and, and understanding, like, like Lee said, that the audience wants physical, tangible, pro t tangible product that you can actually build and keep growing as an artist throughout your career. You're not tied to a major label. So there's actually a democratization of music that I find very appealing with the digital realm. Okay. Is that, you know, we, you can remove the gatekeepers, but then you got to become your own gatekeeper to ensure the quality. You know, you got to become yeah. the man, basically. That's what it comes down to. Well, that's or the, the woman. what we've or done woman, yes. as <laughs> when Sean sort of talks about it on, a, you know, a, a cottage industry level, what we've done is try to take back control of all of the creative pieces. So I self-finance all of the recording. Yeah. We go into a big studio, we come home, we do all, all of our overdubbing <clears throat> in our own facilities. We go back into a big studio with a guy like Mike Fraser, we mix it. We do all of our own, you know, we keep our photography and our, the artwork in house. And we, I subcontract out to certain key partners that I have throughout Canada that I, and the, so when I get an album and it's finished, I have had, and, and we've bounced it off as a band, we've had control over every single aspect, the writing, the recording, the mixing, mm -hmm. the mastering, the artwork. And when we give it to a company to license, all of that is done. So we, what we're putting out into the world, we have a hundred percent control of creatively. You've become the woman. 
the woman instead of the man, you become the woman, right? Need a man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what you got to do. You know, you got to yeah. become the industry, right? You got to become the man or the woman, right? Let yeah. me ask you this. You don't have to answer this. I've asked a lot of bands, you know, their most successful albums and your most successful albums are like, I would, I would think is like the first four or five, right? Did you have Probably issues? In Canada. I'm sorry? It would be body rock in Canada. Yeah. Did you have issues with the label, you know, legal issues, not paying you? I mean, and this is the story from every single band from the 80s, right? Always in litigation or trying to get paid. There's still bands today that are still trying to get paid from the 80s, you know, that they felt they were shortchanged or everything kind of went smooth for you. And I know uh, you can answer as much of that as you want. I'm not going to get you in trouble or anything like that. Keep it very high level. Well... I, I will start this conversation by saying that was the commitments fulfilled? That's what that's what the question is. Were the commitments fulfilled? Um, I left Attic Records in 1992. Um, there were various reasons for that. Um, with that said, I want to start this conversation by saying I have a lovely relationship with Al Mayer, who's the former label head of Attic. He's mm -hmm. a lovely guy. Everybody was just doing what they thought was right. The kind of contract that I signed in the 80s was a kind of contract everyone signed in the 80s. Sean mm -hmm. knows this. You know, so do, I don't own my first six masters. I still don't. Yep. When I left Attic, um, you know, they owned those masters and then Attic became merged with Poly. Polygram became Oasis, which became Songcore. Then Songcore went bankrupt. Then the whole the whole attic catalog got bought by a company called Unidisc. Yep. And so my for, first few albums have been bought and sold a few times. You know. Um, so am I making royalties off them? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why it's become, you know, from basically the mid '90s onward my 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 feeling about everything was that i'm i'm never going to sign a contract like that again i'm going to be my own record label i've had three different labels um <clears throat> that's the latest one, incarnation being big sister records and um again we just try to keep everything in house like i'm trying to answer this in a way where like i don't have any bitterness yeah about that it just you know my my, my situation is not unique you know no nope. nope. um nope. but uh you know I got the big house eventually. It was through real estate, though, <laughs> not, because we sold real estate, not because we uh, of music. But um, yeah, that's not. It's well, what what bands lost? Really. What what they lost in the '80s were financial compensation, but what they gained was brand recognition, right? And that name has lasted. <laughs> and you know, the reason why they play festivals today is because of brand recognition, right? And that is a that's an extremely important point that yeah. you're making there because new bands trying to up and coming bands in on an independent level it's nearly impossible it's really hard yeah, and or sure. yeah if you do it. have name brand recognition you're not making any money because everything the kind of contracts that artists are a lot of them are doing the 360s where the, you know the label and i was offered a couple of deals like that on radio one they want a piece of they want your publishing they want a piece of like of your merchandising or the greater share of your merchandising. Um, and it's impossible. You again, it, once again, it's the contract that has the artists at the bottom of the totem pole for being able to make any money. Yeah, no, I'm happy that you've taken control of everything. Sean, what did you want? I know you wanted to weigh in there a little well, bit. I, I was just going to say, you know, you, when you look at music industry contracts, like the, the, in any other business, they would seem so lopsided, so obscene. <laughs> nobody in yeah. the right mind would sign it but you're dealing with supply and demand there are so few slots back then yeah, that you know right. if you wanted to play you had to pay and you paid with the relinquishing of your rights and, and i've done that too yeah uh, you know yeah. What, what the opportunity but as as you guys touched upon the value of the millions of dollars of marketing that went in has allowed artists from that era to go on and 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 have um, a chance to make money that newer artists just don't have anymore. And I can say that from experience. I worked with as a music director for a number of young artists and, I, and seeing some of the budgets that I had to put a band together. I was like, <laughs> I said, I gave my invoice. I said, well, I'm an adult. I have to pay for a house. This is what I charge and, and you get kickback. But, you know, once again, you know, there's more and more people wanting to do it. And the powers that be, that's capitalism. 
Yeah. They're gonna they're gonna take advantage of that situation. But well, the I good think news that is think, those execs don't have jobs anymore. So that's the good news, right? They all got like Yeah, leveled. but you know, <laughs> I will say this in, in in doing the book and talking with people like Alan Niven, you know, they, they the, there was people power back then. And you did have the benefit of the talent of whole marketing departments. A and R departments, and while certainly you could make an argument that sometimes they infringed upon creativity, they also helped bring that message out in a big way. And I think the classic rock artists do benefit from that today. You know, yeah, Chris Sangaritas sure. before he died, he told me, you know what, the album sounded so great back then is because you had the best of the best of the best studios, the best engineers, the best producers. That's why they sounded so great. Now everyone's trying to do it in their home. Actually, I want to pick your brain with one more question here, if you guys still have time. And it sort of pertains to what we're saying. Anita Strauss, she was the guitarist for Alice Cooper. We were talking about yeah. this earlier this yeah. week on the show. And I thought maybe I'd just ask you because it kind of pertains to what we're saying here. So here's this artist who's sort of like in the hard rock world of Alice Cooper. She's a great guitarist, one of the best female guitarists or guitarist today. And then she switches to uh, Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, is this survival? Is this going like this is the music she grew up with? This is the music she was popular with, like the hard rock ish Alice Cooper style. And then she flips gears and she goes into a genre that, you know, it's it's a, a little more different than what her fan base is like. I mean, is that survival, Lee? Is that is that is that I mean, I, what do you I draw the line? Really I mean, she hasn't really gone into any detail on her social media. I do follow Nita, you know, um, about her personal reasons for the change but um honestly i think it's like playing with michael jackson i mean i i think respect to nita if she wants to shift gears and try on something different for for size i mean sean you played with nelly nelly was a pop act I, you know but you love you love your rock and roll and i think that and and kudos totally. to, to demi lovato <clears throat> like that new picture of her out, the, out floating around there's pretty edgy i think that you know, if she's wanting to do something a little more edgy to reflect a, a direction she's going in, she brings Nita on board. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great combination. I, I don't really have, you know, I don't subscribe to that, you know, once in the rock world, you, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you're, you're, well, you're, you're, you're kind of you're, like, you've you're, changed too, right? From jazz right, to rock. Yeah, I don't think she's, right? it's any kind of betrayal to her fan base no. or anything like that. I mean, I've sang jazz, you know, it's, um, it's a chance to expand and grow creatively. And I, I, you know, kudos to her for, for, for taking that opportunity. But is that just, I, I guess my question before Sean, you answer is my question is, is that, is this just a sign of the times where you can't make a living? So you have to flip back and forth between genres to make a living. Right. So Sean, mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, um, to answer that question. No, I don't think so. Because I think she was making probably a pretty good living as somebody toured with Alice Cooper and, you know, like, Alice is, is constantly working. Um, I, I can't speak to the financial situation, but I will tell you this. I, I, don't, I think it's about growth and Lee touched on it. There's a chance here to grow. And, and from my experience, I can draw a parallel. I had just gotten a gig with Helix. Mm. That was a dream gig for me to be in Helix. That was the first band I ever saw in concert. I was so happy, but then the opportunity came to tour the world with Nelly Furtado. Well, I mean, it's, it, it was very difficult, but, you know, Brian Ballmer said, you know, go. This is a chance for you to grow and a chance for you to experience things, grow as a musician. And he gave me his blessing to do that. And uh, and I, I absolutely, absolutely loved it. And the one thing that I learned from that is you will bring your authentic self to the situation anyway. So I'm still the rock and roll guitar player if I'm playing with Nelly Furtado. That's what I am at my heart. I'm a rock and roll guitar player. I'll bring that to the table uh and i think that nita is going to bring that energy to demi and i think that's why she gets a call when you get a call with an artist like this it's because they want you any real artist is going to want you to bring the best of what you have they want the you for what you already are good at exactly it, it, yeah exactly. as you touched upon lee which i'm very grateful for and and and, and absolutely that's a that's a truth so i think it's great and when i see people uh you know denigrating nita for making that choice to me, it smacks of, of ignorance, to be honest with you, and, and, and someone who doesn't yeah. truly understand the impetus to grow as a musician. Well, and one That's of the things that I so love about Sean is you're a, class, a classically trained guitarist, you know, and so when we're doing, say, or if I, you know, we've, 
we've tried to streamline our uh, backline production as we've gone because it's just such a mess with airlines flying things and getting things. And if I say, okay, this is this song was originally recorded on keyboard, but I know I can hand it over to Sean and go figure it out on guitar because we're going to do this ballad, and I know you can do it, and he does. Yeah. And I that is why I love having Sean in the band is because he has those skills. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. So. Thank you. Nice. And, and to that point, can I say one thing yes. you might appreciate? Yeah. I did I did a classical guitar record for Universal, and I insisted we put D by Randy Rhodes on that record. Hey. I said, listen, if anybody got kids playing <laughs> classical guitar, it was Randy Rhodes. I'd even say more than Bach. You know what I mean? It was, uh, you know, like, and, and so you, you bring yourself to those situations. Yeah. Okay. I think we've we've covered a lot today. I think we've learned a lot. Uh, thank you very much. So let me recap here. We got a new album. You got a new album coming out before uh, New Year's, right? Elevate with 10 tracks. It'll either be just before Christmas or <clears throat> just in early 2023. I can't make you a promise at this point. No promises. We've confirmed <laughs> yeah. there's no promises, but we're we're aiming Sometime for Sometime in the next nine months, you're going to see a new album, a new studio album from Leon. Right. You yep. are playing Elmo Campbell. El <laughs> can't pronounce it now Elmo Campbell <laughs> Club in Toronto um a live set will feature a lot of classic songs and some new stuff correct yeah and will yep, be yep, recorded yep. live and when will this live album be released we don't know sometime oh, yeah at some point some yep. point in time <laughs> books are being made as we speak the autobiography yep. of Lee Aaron is still 30,000 words, right? I've been with <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's coming along. <laughs> Sean Kelly, however, has finished. He's managed to beat you in that. And he's got a book about- I got a good up. start, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think what else uh, we, we talked about today. I think that's it. They always say after a meeting to summarize the meeting so we could, uh, you know- Summer dates, yes, summer dates yes, coming yes, up. Yes, yes. So, summer dates coming up, yep, yep. Yeah, yep. Check the website, .com and, for tour dates. And two thumbs up for Nita Strauss. That's what I'm hearing. Two thumbs yeah. up. Yeah. I hope I'm holding yeah. my phone with one, so I'll give you two here. Yeah. And, where, and where are those masters on the first five albums? Where are those masters? We need those masters. <laughs> back. That's what we need. Yeah. Guys, it's been a pleasure. Always fun. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, it was awesome, Jimmy. I've got to go drive, get my son to his part-time job, so i got to run here. <laughs> you bet. No, sorry to keep you. Thanks, Jimmy. Have a great day. Bye-bye.